So good morning, everyone. My name is Heidi Normandin, and I am the director of the Wisconsin Family Impact Seminars. I want to welcome you to the 39th Wisconsin Family Impact Seminar, Beyond Healthcare Policy, Building the Foundation of Health for Wisconsin Families. The Family Impact Seminars are an initiative of the La Follette School of Public Affairs. I'd like to introduce the director of the La Follette School, Susan Yaki. Thank you, Heidi. I wanna give everybody a warm welcome to our first virtual Family Impact Seminar. We're thrilled to have over 250 people registered to join us today. The mission of the La Follette School is to inspire evidence-based policymaking that advances the public good. And the Family Impact Seminars are an excellent example of our commitment to convene decision makers and researchers to talk about the most important policy issues of our days. I look forward to learning from our excellent speakers today about what we can do to ensure that everyone in Wisconsin has good health and well being. Thank you very much for being part of this important conversation. Thank you, Susan. I am really excited to hear from our speakers today, too. Now, if this is your first family impact seminar, um, I want to let you know that UW-Madison has been conducting these family impact seminars at the state capitol since 1993. We have covered a lot of topics in that time, from homelessness to foster care to early childhood adversity. And our sem our, our, the topics for the seminar are selected by a bipartisan advisory board made up of 12 legislators. So we have six Republicans, six Democrats, as well as one representative from the governor's office. And we meet with these advisors every year to select the topic. Now we met with them virtually in May, and this is what they told us what they wanted to learn about this topic. No surprise, they were very interested in learning more about COVID. They were particularly interested in knowing why some racial and ethnic subgroups were being impacted more severely than others. They also wanted to know just more generally why some people have better health and what uh, non-medical factors might be leading up to that. Does income play a role? Does early childhood adversity play a role in health? They also wanted to know what the research says about some policy options outside of the healthcare system that they can implement that can ensure that all Wisconsin families have good health. And our speakers today will answer these questions and more. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I want to let you know that we have posted some resources on our website. We have one of the three issue briefs post, uh, excuse me, one of the four issue briefs posted already. We have the speaker's PowerPoint slides, as well as the family impact guide. Now, as some of you know, we are strictly nonpartisan. We're not in the business of making policy suggestions, but we do promote one idea. And that idea is that better policy decisions are made when the impact on families is taken into consideration. You know, families raise the next generation, they support their members financially and emotionally, and they provide billions of dollars in uncompensated care. And we encourage policymakers to take the family impact into consideration when they are discussing and developing policy. And the Family Impact Guide can help you do so. Okay, so today the format for the seminar is that each speaker will be given either 15 or 25 minutes to present. After each speaker, we will give them about three minutes, give you about three minutes to ask questions to the uh, clarifying questions to them. We want to make sure everybody's on the same page before we move on to the next speaker. After all three speakers have presented, we'll have about 10 minutes remaining for questions to any of the speakers. And we will end in 90 minutes at 10 a.m. Central Time. And you can start to submit your questions right away. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you click that, you'll see a pop-up box. Type in your question. And we would love for you to also share with us your agency or your office so that we know um, where, where your question is coming from and we can select from a wide variety of perspectives during the Q&A portion. And one last thing, we will mention your name unless you tell us not to. Okay, are you ready to get started? So our first speaker today is Patrick Remington. Dr. Remington is a professor emeritus of public health and director of the Preventive Medicine Residency Program at the UW-Madison School of Public Health, excuse me, 
Madison, UW Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. His research focuses on ways to improve population health outcomes through better collection and analysis of public health data. He helped create the Wisconsin County Health Rankings, which counties are using to compare the health of all Wisconsin 72 counties. Now, before joining UW Madison, he spent 10 years with the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. He was their chief medical officer for chronic disease and injury prevention. And then before that, he worked for the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as a medical epidemiologist. He has his medical degree from UW Madison School of Medicine and Public Health, and his master's of public health degree from the University of Minnesota. And today, Dr. Remington will discuss creating the conditions in Wisconsin for all people to live long and healthy lives. Take it away. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Heidi. And it's certainly a pleasure for me to be uh, back with the Family Impact Seminars. I uh, jo uh, gave a talk maybe 15 years ago, and uh, it, it's impressive to see the, long, the longevity of this uh, seminar series. So I will <clears throat> share my screen. Uh, looking to the PowerPoint presentation. And, uh, and then uh, <clears throat> what I'll talk about in the next uh, 15 minutes or so are ways that we can create conditions in Wisconsin so that all people, and I emphasize all people in that we are increasingly focusing on equity for opportunities to live long and healthy lives. Uh, so let me just begin with a simple definition. Uh, what is health? The World Health Organization talks about it as the physical, mental, and social well-being of individuals. And the goal for public health is that all people have an opportunity to live a long and healthy life. Uh, but what contributes uh, to good health? We've long known the importance of clinical care for people who uh, get in sick or injured and uh, increasingly recognize the importance of personal health behaviors. But the last 20 years or so, um, increasing, increasing research and focus has been centered on those social and economic factors uh, in a community, such as the uh, person's education, uh, income, uh, wealth, or, or um, engagement in, in uh, community and social affairs, as well as the physical environment, either the natural or the built environment. And we developed a model at the uh, uh, Population Health Institute for communities uh, across the nation to measure um, the health of their community. And we begin by looking at health outcomes, those uh, factors that determine the, um, uh, uh, the length and the quality of life, uh, the morbidity and mortality. Um, and uh, as far as a way to measure the, the, the current health of a community, um, we, we use these uh, uh, two different measures. But more importantly, this model extended to consider the factors that contribute uh, to healthy communities. And we call those health factors, sometimes you hear them called health determinants. And we show them in four areas, four general areas, health behaviors, clinical care, access, and quality of clinical care, and the social and economic factors, also sometimes called the social determinants. And then uh, the physical environment and the size of these boxes uh, are approximately proportional to the uh, um, contribution of these factors to the health of a community and overall to the health outcomes of that community. And so you can see social and economic factors uh, contribute a significant portion to the health of a community. And finally, our model didn't end there. It doesn't simply explain the differences in the health of communities, but it emphasizes the importance of how we can support the health in community by looking at evidence-based programs and policies, because we know uh, that it is those programs and policies that influence the health factors that eventually lead to uh, improved health outcomes, longer and healthier lives for all. So clearly policies and programs are essential uh, and it's what we do as a society that can create those conditions so that all people can live long and healthy lives. And as policymakers, you lead this effort by setting the agenda and investing in policies and programs to improve that, 
those social determinants, that foundation for a healthy community um, and uh, where uh, individuals and families live. So how healthy is Wisconsin? Uh, this is from 2019, and it shows that Wisconsin's uh, in the middle of the pack in, in the country, uh, ranking that year about uh, 23rd. But I think of interest is that that ranking is not simply an overall ranking of the health, uh, uh, the, the length and quality of life. But shown here in green, you can see some factors where Wisconsin ranks at the top 10, the percent of uh, uh, high school graduates, um, insurance rates, or occupational fatalities. And so that brings our average ranking up. But if you look down in the light green, yellow, uh, light red, and then uh, 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 full badger red, you can see that there's a great diversity in how well we compare to other states. And it's well known that, for example, our rate of binge drinking in the adult population ranks dead last. And interestingly, I think few people know this, is our investment in public health funding uh, ranks last also. And so the complexity of how you measure the overall health of a community means that we have to dig a little deeper when we think about um, not only how healthy the state is, but what could be done to improve the health. And I think uh, I've been following this measure, the uh, America's Health Ranking, since I joined the health department in 1988. It was first published in 1990, and you can see back then uh, the news uh, reporters called and asked why we weren't number one. Uh, we were ranked seventh or eighth that year. But look what's happened over the last 30 years. There's been a slow but progressive decline, what we call a race to the bottom in Wisconsin's long-term ranking. Um, and uh, this median rank has declined from about eight to, to nine in 1990 uh, to 19 in 2018, and then even into the 20s uh, for uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, 2019. And the greatest declines have been in infectious disease, morbidity, infant mortality, and smoking rates. And I think this drop in relative health for our state is really a call to action, not just to address those health outcomes, infant mortality, infectious diseases, and health behaviors like smoking, but to address the root causes, the social and economic fabric of our state that increases the risk of these health outcomes. And we can see within Wisconsin, the health outcomes, again, this is a summary measure of the length and quality of life, uh, varies dramatically across the state. There are some counties in the Southeast, southeastern part of the state, Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha. In the central, uh, as Aldo Leopold called them, the sand counties of the state, Juneau Adams County, and then in the northeast part of the state. Interestingly, those are the same counties that rank lower in those health factors, the social and economic factors, the physical uh, and built environment, health behaviors, and healthcare quality. You can see those counties Again, southeastern Wisconsin's, the central counties, and the northern tier of rural counties, ranking much lower than the counties in uh, uh, Dane County, for example, in the Fox Valley, uh, and in the, in the Minneapolis St. Paul metropolitan area. This a slide shows an interesting uh, rainbow effect of the health of the state. And uh, on the bottom axis, you can see this is infant death rates the rate of infants who do not survive their first year of life. Um, and Wisconsin overall ranks about seven, oh, six and a half or seven deaths per thousand. We're not the best in the country, that's Massachusetts, and we're not the worst in the country, that's M Mississippi. But you can see within Wisconsin, each of these flags shows the subgroups uh, by race, and you can see African-American infant mortality rates are far worse than any other group in the state, far worse than any other state in the nation at 17.2. On the other end of the spectrum, you see that people, uh, women with a high school uh, or a college degree or living in suburban communities have much better infant uh, uh, mortality experiences, uh, better than any state in the nation. And it's this disparity uh, by race, by place, by education, uh, and by gender that we uh, uh, need to focus on. These are the important outcomes that are the result of differences in opportunity, difference in social and economic uh, factors. So in summary, uh, I, I think of healthy people, uh, a goal for our nation, 
uh, means more than simply uh, the length and quality of life. It really means having healthy families and vibrant communities. Um, it's clear from the evidence that Wisconsin's health ranking has declined relative to other states. This really race to the bottom of health in our nation. And we also see significant disparities in health within the state, especially by race and social and economic factors. And I think state policymakers are really in a key uh, position to build the foundation to look at those policies and programs that can help lift up communities, lift up families um, to have an opportunity to live a long and healthy life. So the rest of this session this morning, will look at two general areas uh, building on, on my comments. And first is what are the underlying factors driving the health, these health differences, focusing on the role of race and uh, racism and how that can affect uh, health. Uh, Dr. Siddiqui will address these. And Dr. Peter Munig will talk about how we can make sure that policies and programs are effective, not just thinking about their impact overall, but their impact on uh, health equity, and in fact, their cost uh, and value of each dollar invested uh, to deliver good health, uh, not just overall, but for all people within the population. So I'm going to end there and stop sharing my screen. And I think I'm, Heidi, tell me I wasn't, I, I had my timer here, but I forgot to turn it on. So tell me how I'm doing on time. Dr. Remington, you did perfectly. You have a really good internal clock. So we are right on time. So everybody, we have three minutes now for clarifying questions. Now, if you've just joined us, we are accepting questions throughout the seminar. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Click on that. There's a pop-up box. You can submit questions at any time. If you could just tell us your office or your agency, that will help us pull from a variety of questions for you. Okay, so we do actually have a question um, from Rebecca Murray of the Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board. She asks, um, for the Wisconsin health ranking, excuse me, the Wisconsin rankings on health factors, are those data available by race? Yes, uh, Rebecca, they are. <clears throat> and in two ways, uh, America's Health Ranking, uh, which is uh, supported by the United Health Foundation, um, is available at, uh, I think it's americashealthranking.org. You can just Google that. Um, but within w Wisconsin, the county health rankings, if you go to countyhealthrankings.org, it's a nationwide program supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but led by the UW's Population Health Institute. If you go there, you can see each of these factors and where available, they are broken out by subgroups such as race. And obviously <clears throat> the county health rankings focuses on place uh, on the county of residents, uh, but we know that the fabric of a community within the county uh, is e equally important. And so that it's really a rich data set. Uh, so, so check those out at countyhealthrankings.org. Thank you, Dr. Remington. I think that that is all we have for clarifying questions. We do have other questions rolling in that we will save until the end. I wanna just make two announcements. I did mention the um, some of the resources that are available on our website. I didn't mention our URL. That is wisfamilyimpact.org. That's W-I-S familyimpact.org. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we are recording this uh, seminar and we will be sharing it with you after the seminar. So no worries. Great. So thank you very much, Dr. Remington. Thank you. Okay. Now, before we hear from our next speaker, I want to let you know that we do have an evaluation that we will be sending to you by email today. We would really appreciate it if you would just spend a couple of minutes letting us know what you thought of the seminar. That information is so important to us to help us improve our seminars from year to year. We also share that information with our funders. So please uh, look for that email from us today. I also wanna take a moment to mention the members of our advisory board. I mentioned the members, the 12 legislators and the one representative from the governor's office. You're probably wondering who those people are. So let me take a moment just to recognize them. In the assembly, we have representative Jill Billings, Gordon Hintz, Dave Murphy, and Patrick Snyder. In the Senate, we have Senator Melissa Agard, 
Joan Balwig, Janet Bewley, Alberta Darling, Latanya Johnson, Patrick Teston, and former Senators Mark Miller and Luther Olson. And from the governor's office, we have Catherine Domina. These advisors give us their time throughout the year. They help us select the seminar topics. They also give us advice on how we can better provide research to state policymakers. So thank you so much to all of our advisors. We really appreciate the time and the support that you have given us this past year. And if we were in person, we would all start clapping and thank them. So, um, so let us move on. Our next speaker today is Arjuman Siddiqui. Dr. Siddiqui is a professor of public health and the Canada Research Chair in Population Health Equity at the University of Toronto. Dr. Siddiqui studies how conditions in society produce health inequities, particularly racial health inequities, and which social policies resolve them. Much of her research uses macro level data to understand socioeconomic conditions and health inequities within the US, but she also compares the US to other countries. She was a member of the World Health Organization's Commission on Social Determinants of Health Knowledge Hub on Early Childhood Development. And she's consulted with several international organizations such as the World Bank and UNICEF. She received her doctorate in social epidemiology from Harvard University. And today her presentation will cover addressing racial health disparities, what matters most. Take it away. Thanks so much, Heidi. It's so nice to be with everyone. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen here. Ooh, having a little... Uh, whoop, hold on one second. I think I here we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can. You're good. Okay, great. Thank you. Again, really nice to be with you. And Patrick, thanks so much for such a great uh, presentation. And I think a lot of what I'll present uh, will resonate with what Patrick's mentioned as well. So let me start by talking a little bit about the moment that we're in about COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic. Um, and if you look at uh, what we have is a, clearly a situation where overall COVID rates are out of control. Uh, it's true here in Canada as well, to a lesser extent. Um, but one of the most disturbing things about the pandemic is that it really is being felt unequally. And this is a graph, a, a sort of graph map that shows you how many states have disproportionate COVID rates in African Americans. So any state that is that is colored in sort of the orange hues um, are states in which black people have more COVID than white people with the darker the orange, the worse the situation. And on the left is the situation for COVID deaths. And on the right, the situation for COVID cases. And you can see in both situations that Wisconsin has disproportionate COVID happening in black people compared to white people. And here's a sort of zoom in of, uh, Wisconsin statistics. This is laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases in Wisconsin. And if you look across racial groups, you'll see uh, that for, for example, for black people, the COVID rates are almost five times those for whites. For people who reported multiple or other races, it's, it's about 10 times uh, the COVID races uh, compared to whites, which is really, really profound. Um, so, one of the most disturbing things about this is that these racial disparities in COVID-19 were entirely predictable, even when we didn't know what COVID really was or how it was transmitted, we still could have predicted that racial health disparities would happen. And that's because of the science on racial health disparities that's built up. And let me take you through some of that science that kind of tells you why we could and should have known this and what we might be able to do about it. Uh, you know, it's never, never too late. So the first lesson that we've learned from the science is that racial health disparities are pervasive and they are persistent. They happen across time, across outcomes, across age groups. 
The second lesson is that racial health disparities are not due to genetic differences between racial groups, and that's because there's no genetic basis for race. It's not even like you, you can say, well, it's not mostly genes. It's, it, there's just no genetic basis for race and therefore no genetic basis for racial health disparities. The third lesson is that racial disparities really are attributable to the role that racism plays in basically conditioning people's everyday lives. So people who are exposed to more racism have more challenging everyday living circumstances and it's those everyday living circumstances, what Patrick referred to as the social determinants of health that really pay the, the, play their key role in, in developing our health. So let's talk a little bit about the evidence first on the first part, which is that racial disparities are pervasive and persistent. If you look at Wisconsin's health report cards, you can see that Wisconsin earned a C or a D grade for racial disparities in every age group, from infants to older ages, across the board, uh, there are health disparities. Um, this is also true across outcomes, whether it's nutrition, prenatal care, ho hospital health care, unintentional injuries, homicides, cancer, cardiovascular disease. Across the board, we see racial health disparities. Um, and this is also true across time. So this is a graph or a couple of graphs that show you mortality rates, death rates for infectious diseases from 1900 till about 1940 or 1950. And each line is a region of the US. So the Midwest is that orange, light orange line. Um, and on the left are the death rates from infectious disease for whites and on the right for non-whites. And so you can see that even back then, um, non-whites consistently had higher death rates compared to whites for infectious diseases. The other really um, disturbing thing about racial disparities in health is that they tend to be maintained whether things are good or bad overall. So this is a graph of infant mortality rates in the US by race. And you can see that over time from 1935 into the 2000s, infant mortality rates have been declining for all groups. That's wonderful news. The problem is that the disparity between blacks and whites persists. The black people, even when their rates are declining, are, are still experiencing uh, a disparity compared to whites. So what we kind of have against that backdrop of persistent and pervasive racial health inequalities is enter the COVID era and essentially COVID-19 is another manifestation of persistent and pervasive racial health disparities. And that's the context in which to think about uh, COVID and race. So as I mentioned, the second lesson we've learned is that racial health disparities really are not due to genetic differences. Um, here is a picture of what the world would likely perceive as a black uh, man and a white woman. And if you look at their genetic makeup, they share more than 99% of their genetic code, as do we all. And if you look on the right, the Human Genome Project, uh, the, a, a US venture to understand the human genome has studied this. They've studied how the ge genetic code of humans backs into what we call racial groups. And what they've realized is that we, as humans, we have sort of this perception that groups with different ancestries, African, East Asian, and so on, maybe we share some genes as depicted on the left-hand side under the word misconception, but in essence, we are three groups. And, and what they're saying is that actually the reality is more like the right-hand side, which is that we have almost total overlap and where we don't have total overlap it's not systematic between racial groups. So that if you, gave, you, if you had uh, the genetic code of two different people and no other information about them, you could not tell what racial group they belong to. 
Here's another uh, way to kind of uh, uh, show that that's the case. This is a study that was done in which they looked at the distribution of birth weight in three different groups, moms who gave birth in Illinois, uh, but those moms had been born in Africa and immigrated to the US. And then moms who gave birth in Illinois, but they themselves were born in the US and were uh, moms were either black or white. And so they looked at the three distributions and the two distributions that overlap the most are the distributions of African born black women and US born white women. It's the US born black distribution that's shifted to the riskier left hand side. So all this to say, if we were to look at black women and think that the reason that their birth weights are different than whites is genetic, studies like this, studies like the Human Genome Project uh, fly in the face of that entirely. If you look at this study, which was done in um, comparing Indian Pima Indians in Arizona and Mexico, this again highlights the same thing. This is a single genetic group, if you will, because it's an American Indian tribe that's been relatively isolated. Uh, and yet the difference in type two diabetes between Pima Indians that live on the Mexican side of the border versus the Arizona US side of the border is 5.5 fold different. So 6.9% type two diabetes in Mexican Pima Indians versus 38% in US Pima Indians. So the top two pictures here are pictures of siblings. So um, you can imagine that in society, these siblings would be racialized quite differently and yet they are siblings. They, they, sh they share uh, uh, um, you know, their genetic code. Um, and the idea is that indeed these people will have because of their racial identity in society, very different experiences of the world and therefore different health outcomes. The, the sweet little kids on the left will grow up and have a life trajectory of different health outcomes, but that difference is not because they have genetic differences. The difference in their health will be attributable to how they are treated, what they experience in life by virtue of the social groups we have constructed that we call racial groups. So racial groups are not a, a figment of our imagination, they exist, we identify people by race, but the point of the science is that when we do that, we've socially decided where to make cutoffs on who is white, who is black, et cetera. That cutoff does not correspond to genes. It corresponds to life experiences. So the third lesson is that racial disparities are, again, due to racism and the effect of racism on your everyday living conditions. And it's your everyday living conditions that are your fundamental determinants of health, as Patrick pointed out, the largest share, uh, as it's often thought of, uh, of the determinants of health tend to be the social determinants of health. And the World Health Organization has developed a framework that's a little busy, so I'll walk you through it quickly. Um, so if you look to the left, the left is uh, this kind of social environment. It's not even your race and class, it's the policies, it's the societal conditions. And the idea is that it is those conditions that essentially shape how people in that next box how people are treated by their class, by their gender, by their race, and so on. And those things affect the next box to the right, which is your living conditions and your stress and your behaviors and so on. And that is what ultimately affects your health. And so the message of the science and the message of the World Health Organization Commission was that health disparities exist and they certainly are manifested in different ways through behaviors and so on. But essentially the fundamental issue is why and how your social position in society is determining your chances at living well, your chances at um, exercising good behaviors. And that the thing that we can do about that is to address policy. So in your packet, you will have a uh, framework like this that I think Patrick alluded to and, and you may have seen elsewhere. It's just a different schematic of the same idea. So I thought I'd just put it up to show you that these 
uh, frameworks are kind of depicted in, in different ways, but the idea is very similar. And that is that policies really determine how and why we have health disparities because they determine how and why people with different social position have opportunities to be healthy. So if we zoom in on the issue of race, so we take that framework and we just kind of distill it down to what's happening with race. Again, the essential issue is that we see racial disparities in health because racism affects how many resources people have by race and what their stress experiences are. So everyone has stress. Everyone has, uh, you know, or a lot of people have issues with material conditions. And, and, you know, there are lots of people who are struggling. The point of the kind of health disparities um, uh, data is that the, that there are systematic differences across groups. And that doesn't diminish the fact that there's individuals in every racial group who are struggling and people who are struggling in all sorts of conditions. Um, but it does mean that there is a systematic uh, difference in what is happening by racial group and that that is attributable to the role of racism. And let me give you some examples of some studies that show this. On the left-hand side is a, is a graph that reflects a study that was done in which some economists from MIT uh, and University of Chicago sent out resumes to real jobs. And the resumes were identical in every way. The people had gone to the same schools, had the same job experience, et cetera. But what they did is they changed the name on the resume uh, and you had half of them with uh, black sounding names and half of them with white sounding names. And then they got that data from birth certificates to figure out what are common names for African Americans and common names for whites. And they looked at uh, when they sent those resumes out to real jobs, how many of those names uh, got callback offers. And they found a systematic difference in which white names were much more likely to get called back for interviews than black names, despite the resumes being identical in every other way. And so part of the message of their study was that racism is coming into effect before someone even has a chance to get in the door. The right-hand side shows an equally uh, uh, striking uh, study. Uh, this is a study by Diva Pager, uh, who was at Princeton and then at Harvard. Unfortunately, she passed away all too suddenly and soon. Um, so she did a study in which she wanted to know what is the penalty for having a criminal record when you go into the job market? And um, so she looked, she essentially trained actors to go out and, and look for jobs and, and apply for jobs. And these actors were racially diverse and some were purportedly had a, had a criminal record and some didn't. And um, when they did this study, they found that indeed on the left-hand side, those two bars on the left, you can see that if you had a, uh, uh, sorry, the, the two, um, uh, the criminal record versus the non-criminal record, the criminal record bars show that you had a much lower chance overall of getting a job if you had a criminal record than if you didn't. But what's really striking is when you break that down by race, what you see is that whites with a criminal record, that's that orange bar that says 17%, were more likely to get a job uh, uh, offer than Blacks without a criminal record. Uh, very, very striking finding about the role of race in our labor market. And you can see this translates on the large scale. So this is national data. On the left, racial gaps in income. On the right, racial gaps in wealth. Again, just like the infant mortality story, even in good times, as incomes have risen for, for groups, the disparity remains. And in some cases, the disparity increases over time, which is the most disturbing of all scenarios. We also know that this is not about 
culture. This is not about people not wanting to work hard or not valuing education, which is a very common narrative. And one of the roles of science has been to work its way through what is narrative, what are stories that we tell about how the world works, and what do we see when we look at the evidence objectively. So this is a study in which they asked racial groups uh, would you like to obtain a university degree? Do you think that you, you this is something that you'd like to do in the future? And on the left hand side, you can see that actually black people were more likely to report wanting uh, to obtain a university degree. Unfortunately, on the right hand side is the opposite story, which is a question about whether you think you will obtain a university degree. And in that case, whites were much more likely to say that they think they will obtain a university degree. So this is the kind of data that tells us this is about something we can do in policy terms. If this was a culture story, there wouldn't be that much we could do in policy terms to alter uh, what we're doing to give people opportunities. But this data tells us there's lots we can do because it's really not a culture story. It really is a story about how people experience social circumstances and what they think their possibilities are. It's the story of saying to kids like this, you can all have opportunity. It's not about your genes. It's not about your culture. As a society, we can provide uh, opportunities for you. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, the effects of racism affect your everyday living conditions and that affects your health. And it does that in many ways. One way is your health behaviors. So your everyday living conditions give you opportunities to behave well, either because uh, you know, the, the kind of environments that you're in are more conducive to eating healthy and exercising. Maybe it's because you have less stress and so you have more time and will and energy and so on to engage in healthy behaviors and so on. Um, but we also learning that there is a direct physiological effect of racism. So if you look at this data, um, the top two lines are the physiological stress, the allostatic load, as scientists call it, of Black people who are in a higher income group and a lower income group. And then the bottom two lines are white people in higher and lower income groups. And what this graph suggests is that irrespective of income, Black people are experiencing higher levels of stress throughout their lives compared to white people. This is a graph that um, shows telomere length. Telomeres are part of our DNA and they're affected by stress. And they essentially are a predictor of how much biological aging is happening in our bodies, how sort of worn our bodies are over time. And essentially what these graphs suggest is that uh, Black and Hispanic people in those bottom two lines, the pink and the blue, have lower, shorter telomere lengths than white people. And shorter telomere lengths indicate more biological aging. So essentially, again, you know, there's this situation where racial disparities are happening because of racism affecting your material circumstances and uh, racism affecting your direct biological stress uh, experiences. So if we take this into the COVID era and try to understand what's happened with COVID, the essential story is that um, people who are racialized are more likely to be essential service workers. So in the COVID era where a lot of us are working from home, the people who have to go to work are more likely to be non-white than they are to be white and therefore to have to go out and show up for work and expose uh, themselves. So if you look at Wisconsin data, white people make up 85% of all workers, but 82.7% of frontline workers. Conversely, black people make up 5.1% of all workers, but 8.2% of, uh, of frontline workers. And why is this happening? Again, this is a story of racism in the kinds of 
uh, experiences of life that dictate what kind of work you end up doing. And so in this case, you can see um, that discrimination in the education and labor mark market uh, are, are playing a role. This is Wisconsin data uh, on uh, education. And I'll just turn your attention to the Wisconsin column. And if you look at the columns that say black and white, you can start to see the disparities emerge. So the percentage of uh, the population with a high school degree or more is 81.6% for blacks, only 90, uh, and sorry, 92.8% uh, for whites. For uh, how many people were proficient on the state assessment in math in eighth grade, 9.7% of blacks compared to 47.6% of whites. Graduation rates, 64.1% of blacks compared to 92.9% .9 of whites. And you can see the state ranking for the US, uh, Wisconsin is unfortunately not doing well at all. And again, this is a result just like health results are of your social circumstances of what kinds of opportunities are being provided. It is not a, a story of culture and it's not a story of genes. This is Wisconsin data on child poverty that I'm sure uh, you're familiar with, but look at that top line of uh, black poverty rates for children uh, is you know, in excess of 30% compared to uh, below 10% for whites consistently. And again, you know, there are good times and bad times, um, but disparities tend to be maintained, which is really um, very alarming. So if you think about the other evidence that I presented about the fact that racism is affecting other health outcomes, you can also see that there's a, another story that might be emerging, which is that to the extent that you're exposed to COVID and your body has to cope with COVID and, and, and exercise an immune response, there may be compromised immunity in non-whites, particularly uh, in people experiencing more racism, like Black people, like Indigenous people, uh, because of the impact of racism, again, on your physiological uh, uh, aging, on your, on your physiological stress. And so it's possible that we don't really know yet that the kind of effects that racism has going into the COVID era actually lead to more severe COVID outcomes uh, for non-white people. The other thing I wanted to mention is that not only do we have racial health disparities, they seem to have worsened over time. And so if you look at the Wisconsin report cards from 2010 to 2016, you can kind of see evidence of this, that um, something's getting worse. And, and that's something to sort of consider as you think about policies. Um, my, my sort of, my, my thinking about this as I look not only at Wisconsin, but what's happened in many societies is that one of the key factors is that we tend to, when we exercise programs and policies to address health disparities, we tend to do behavioral interventions. And I think what's happening is that we're not addressing the upstream root causes, which are the social determinants of health, which are access to opportunity and so on. Um, and that if you work downstream, you're simply not going to be able to make up for what the root causes um, exercise. Moreover, if you think about COVID, and I mentioned it's sort of just another manifestation of health disparities, what happens is, let's say you do a program downstream to address racial disparities in smoking or in obesity you might address that downstream mechanism, but because you didn't address the fundamental cause of all disparities, that cause operates through another mechanism. And in this case, that other mechanism is COVID. And so it's, it's very difficult to, to sort of make any sizable change without addressing the upstream uh, issues. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. That was wonderful. We've had some questions rolling in. Before I start with the questions, I wanted to let everybody know, um, if you've just joined us, we are recording this seminar, so you will get a copy of the recording. And Dr. Siddiqui mentioned a packet or issue briefs. Um, we do have issue uh, one of the four issue briefs available on our website. It does have the graphic that she mentioned. So as soon as the seminar is done, rush over to our website at wisfamilyimpact.org. 
Okay, so we do have a, a just a, a time for about one or two questions. Um, we have a question from uh, Senator Latanya Johnson. She's asking, could you please explain telomere lengths and why Blacks and Hispanics have shorter lengths? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. So telomere lengths, telomeres are uh, a part of the DNA. They're sort of at the, at, at the uh, not, they're not part of the core um, uh, 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 part of the DNA, but they're part of the molecule. And essentially what research has found is that telomeres um, react to the amount of stress we're experiencing in life, irrespective of race. If you're experiencing a lot of stress in your life uh, over time, particularly chronic stress, telomeres tend to shorten. And what the science has found is that that shortening is a marker for your health. It's essentially a marker for how much uh, sort of physiological health you have. And they sort of refer to it as aging. It's like a, a marker of how much physiological or biological aging is happening. So because telomere length is, is important and is responsive to stress, we are finding that there are racial differences in telomere length because there are racial differences in the experience of everyday chronic stress. So it's not that there's anything biological or essential or genetic that would make Black people more predisposed uh, to shorter telomere length. The issue is that Black people's lives are, are sort of filled with more chronic stress and that chronic stress is what's systematically creating differences in telomere length. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddiqui. I think that is all the time we have for clarifying questions right now, but I do encourage everybody to continue to submit your questions. Look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, so please go ahead and continue to submit your questions throughout the seminar, and we will get to a lot more questions at the very end. So thank you very much. Okay, so it is a tradition here at the Family Impact Seminars to get a sense of who is in the room. So we are not in a room, but we are in a virtual room. So we want to know who is on the webinar with us today. So when you see the poll pop up, please indicate what role group you are from, and we'll get a sense of who is joining us today. We have over 190 people on the webinar right now, and I'll give you just three more seconds to fill out the poll, and then we can see who is here. Great. All right. I think we can end the poll and share the results. So we have we have a great, we have a really nice uh, representation from legislators and legislative staff, great showing from state agency staff, university faculty, lots of others. Welcome. We are so glad you are joining us today. Thank you all for being here and for doing what you do to help make the health of Wisconsin families better. Okay, so let's move on to our final speaker. Let's see. Our final speaker today is Peter Munig. Peter Munig, Dr. Munig is a professor of health policy and management at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. His research combines randomized controlled trials with cost effectiveness studies to determine the best mix of social policies so that government leaders can determine how to obtain the best value for their investments. He has studied smaller class sizes, pre-kindergarten programs, lead abatement programs, welfare reform, transportation policies, and health insurance. He has led multiple grants for the National Institutes of Health, and he's published more than 160 studies in leading journals. Dr. Munig received his, received his medical degree from the University of California at San Diego and his master's of public health degree from Columbia University. And today he'll talk about the economic benefits of social policy for health. Great, nice to meet you all. Um, so uh, I have essentially four points to make here today. If I can get my slideshow going, there we go. Um, and the first point is that the health and well-being of Americans is on the decline. And uh, it's not just uh, with Wisconsin, as Pat and Argument said, Wisconsin is kind of falling to the bottom of the US. 
but the U.S. itself is falling amongst peer nations. And this is happening in parallel with uh, disposable income. So this bottom line you're seeing is the compensation after health expenditures. That's basically what Americans have to buy cars, TV, trucks, food, uh, all that stuff. Um, the third point is that this economic distress produces psychological stress, as uh, Arjuman just, just sort of laid out very nicely. Um, and telomere length is one example of human aging um, that's impacted by uh, this chronic exposure to psychological stress. So this is going to be the murkiest point of what I'm talking about today. So I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, this point right here about stress. The fourth point is that as policymakers, you can intervene on this process. So there's levers to pull to reduce stressors, uh, to reduce racial disparities, socioeconomic disparities, and overall stress in society. And as you already know, you can you know, reduce toxic exposures and accidents and uh, improve neighborhood conditions and things like that too. That's pretty straightforward. So let's get on to this first point, the health of Americans has been on the decline for decades. So this is not something that's happening in other nations. These are uh, comparable country averages. You see that life expectancy increases over time. It's just a natural phenomena. As technology increases and humans change, uh, it tends to improve. In the United States, however, it's on the decline. And we have some guesses as to why this is happening. One is this toxic stress that I'll go into in a little bit of detail in a minute. Another is toxic exposures, accidents. Then of course you have neighborhood conditions, things like that. Hopefully this guy is not in your neighborhood. Um, the, way that, the way that humans adapted to stress for you know, much of human history as hunter and gatherers was we, we had this response that would help us survive an attack by a predator. So you see this guy and you're either gonna live or die. And when you, when you see him, what happens is you have this visual image of this threat in your environment and your body just starts pumping out adrenaline and pumping out glucocorticoids. And what's happening is those chemicals are diverting energy from all the organs in your body into your thighs so you can run and get the heck out of there. Now, we all have experience with the, the stress response, but in modern day society, it's not about this acute, quick threat that causes the release of these chemicals. It's a slow burn, right? So we're, we have chronic stressors and this chronic stress is causing wear and tear on our body. Now. This is an example that you're looking at here that we've all experienced. Uh, everybody in the room has had final exams, including my poor students, um, and I'm not gonna put them through this, but uh, final exams um, are a form of short-term stress that we're, that we're all familiar with. Now, in modern day society, we have stress from morning until night, right? But final exams is an especially hard kind of stress. And this is a kind of stress you, you might experience with poverty. You can't pay your bills. Uh, you can't put food on your table for your family. Uh, your automobile is being you know, repossessed. You've got all these very intense stressors. And it's, it's much more intense than taking final exams. The experience you have with final exams is, well, you, know, you don't sleep. Um, you eat junk food, uh, you don't take good care of yourself, uh, and you have this sort of chronic wear and tear on your body. So this is the slow burn that I'm talking about. And one of the, one of the impacts from glucocorticoids taking energy from all of your body organs and causing your telomeres to shorten and your cells to rapidly age um, is that neurons become fragile. And the brain controls everything in the body, including the regulation of your uh, blood pressure and your cholesterol and your blood sugar. And this endocrine control, um, you know, is part of the whole normal aging process. As we get older, um, our blood sugar tends to decline. Um, at diabetes, your risk of diabetes increases, blood pressure increases. Um, this is all part of the normal aging process. This process happens much more rapidly to people who are under stress. 
Now there's a policy lever that we can pull to fix this. Um, and as Artiman mentioned, this, is, this, is, this whole process is called allostatic load. So the point is all of us age, the question is how fast? So let's, let's take a look at this example of a lever that we might be able to pull. Okay, so let's just look at education really quickly and run through this. So educational attainment can do a couple of things for us. One thing is that it can, it can do is that it can give us a degree or it can you know, give us learning, hopefully, if we study and pay attention in class. Um, if we just breeze through and, like Jeff Winger in community and uh, get our degree, then we end up um, with a, still a better job that, that hopefully provides health insurance and uh, is less stress because we have enough money to put food on our table, right? Another thing that can do is it can improve cognition and cognition is gonna improve your job performance and get you that promotion and more money, but it's also gonna improve your understanding of behavioral risk factors. So people with higher levels of education have much lower levels of cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, infectious disease, much less likely to die of COVID, for example. And part of that is this stress process here. And part of it is all of these fa other factors like diet, exercise, neighborhood conditions. Um, so education is gonna reduce your toxic exposures. It's gonna reduce your chances of accidents and crime victimization as well. Why? Because you're going to be more. You're going to have more resources to live in a better neighborhood. So, how do we make these investments as policymakers? There's lots of things that you could potentially do. Uh, I'll walk through some of these in a second, but let's just take a look at one one example. So, if you look at the United States ranking in education, uh, just as a, just as life expectancy is falling and falling and falling over time. Uh, our, our educational uh, capabilities are falling relative to our peer nations uh, in math, sciences, and readings. And the leaders here are nations like Korea, Finland, and Canada. And Canada's a peer nation. They're just as diverse or more diverse than the United States in some ways. Um, very similar economy, but way up there in education. So what's, what's similar amongst all these countries? Well, certainly... Uh, the classrooms have different levels of crowding and uh, resources and things like that. But one thing that's very similar across all of these countries is that they don't spend a lot of money on computers and fancy stuff. They just have overhead projectors. They put all the resources into teachers. So if you're a teacher in a country like Finland and you're in a bar and uh, you meet somebody, uh, they're gonna give you their phone number. But in the United States, they might walk away because teachers don't make a whole lot of money here and it's not a very prestigious uh, profession. So imagine you made it a prestigious profession by increasing teachers' salaries. So this is just a hypothetical example. So if it's true that teacher quality matters and that you know pumping up the salary is gonna increase competition for the best teachers, then, uh, you know, we could potentially move up in our rankings. But the only way we can really know this is through experimental studies. So as I run through some examples of policies that I've studied in my life, I'll give them a rank based, based upon the strength of what we know. Okay, so what are our policy options uh, for slowing human decline and aging? You know, we can intervene in schooling, healthcare, income support, criminal justice reform, housing. There's a lot of things that we can do. Um, and where these things intervene in the disease process matters. So primary prevention is preventing disease before it happens. Secondary is getting it early. Tertiary is making sure that it doesn't get bad. Uh, so, so an example here would be EPA regulations uh, would reduce your exposure to carcinogens and therefore reduce the chance that you're going to get cancer in the first place. Uh, mammography or colonoscopy is another way we could spend our money, but that is spending it on something that's already occurred, right? So now cancer is already in your body and you're trying to catch it early. And then uh, the third thing that we could do is try to treat the cancer after it's occurred with cancer chemotherapy. So obviously the most desirable thing is to prevent it. And that's really where you guys come in as policymakers because uh, you can 
prevent disease by pulling policy levers. And um, one way you're gonna do this is through the aging process and human stress. And another way you're gonna do it is through, you know, reducing accidents and those kinds of things that are much more obvious. So I'm gonna run through these. Now, imagine you have a budget of $8 million and uh, you could spend it on anything to improve the number of lives uh, that get saved um, with your $8 million. So you could spend it on mammography, say. So mammography is an example of a secondary preventive intervention. It detects disease early. Costs about $8 million to save a life with mammography. Uh, so you're gonna save one life with your 8 million bucks. Uh, the evidence behind what the story that I just told you though is pretty weak. And why is it weak? Well, it's weak because we can't really randomize women to receive mammography or not receive it and then see if they die of breast cancer. Uh, you can only do observational studies. So we really don't know if breast cancer, if uh, mammography is uh, life-saving or not. Uh, we don't know if that $8 million is a reliable number. It could be much, could save many more lives or it could not save any lives. Uh, the major point here though, is that it's not just mammography in the secondary preventive category that would just save one lives. We get similar numbers for treating high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. Remember, these are medications that we're taking after a disease process has already set in really expensive to do it also costs about eight million dollars to save a life and these drugs come with side effects you need to treat about 300 people to prevent one uh, uh, heart attack or stroke um, for uh, blood pressure with blood pre pressure medication and uh, a lot of people have bad side effects from it so uh, it's quite expensive to do it better to prevent it before it happens um, but here with these medications We've got great evidence, multiple randomized controlled trials. That's the gold standard for how we know things in science. Okay, so let's look at a primary preventive intervention, seatbelts, uh, prevent injuries from occurring in the first place. Seatbelt legislation, it's wonderful. Uh, it costs 2,790 to save a life. So with our $8 million investment, we're gonna have you know almost 300 lives saved uh, by investing in seatbelts. Um, we can't randomize people to seatbelts, but we can uh, observe these outcomes in, in, under laboratory experimental conditions. So the evidence is pretty good. And it's kind of like jumping out of a plane with a parachute. You pretty much know that it, it's going to save lives. Um, but the, I, I'm gonna give that an eight out of 10 because we don't actually do that in humans, uh, put seatbelts on them or not. Um, Influenza vaccination, about 1.4 million to save a life most seasons. This is based upon randomized trials in humans. So it's a 10 out of 10. We'd save six lives. So we're better off spending our $8 million on influenza vaccination than on blood pressure medications, for example, which we only save one life. So save, you know, five additional lives. That's pretty good. Uh, but now we get into the things that will start to reduce stress and the stress response. Uh, income support programs range from cost savings to pretty good deals. Right? The, one way or another, uh, income support programs are going to come in better than uh, mammography or blood pressure medication, which are things that we're going to, you know, we, we've agreed we're going to do. Um, it, they take many forms, and that's why the range of values is so big. So SNAP is just a basic uh, food stamp program. It's just basically giving people a cash equivalent, um, but these programs can also get quite complicated and quite expensive. And that's when the programs can start to get uh, less cost effective. Okay, so we have experimentally tested and I've been a part of these experimental trials as a PI and lead scientist on a number of them. Uh, and I've run a, num a number of these uh, uh, studies on older, older trials as well. Uh, we've tested this in humans multiple times, cash support in one form or another, whether it's you know, to an incentive to, to get a job or uh, direct giving, um, it is uh, going to 
increase your life expectancy. It's going to improve your health. And we think that this is one reason why countries like Canada uh, do better than the United States is because they have better cash support programs um, that are comprehensive and uh, more centrally focused. So you know, there's not just sort of scattershot programs all over the place, state by state. Uh, and that's one reason why Canada is moving ahead in life expectancy and we're moving behind. Um, so, you know, we can maximally invest these interventions uh, that save money and lives. So if, if we look at income support programs that save money and lives, we can just spend, you know, the sky's the limit. It's, it's return on investment. It's like buying a mutual fund that's going to pay out 20% over the person's lifetime. You're, it's a no brainer. You just buy it. Restricted housing vouchers are another form of income support in some ways uh, that save money and lives. But this is, a, this is a different program from traditional income support. Uh, housing vouchers, uh, Section 8 vouchers um, will support rents in, uh, for, for low-income families. Um, and they tend to support rents in low-income neighborhoods. Now, if you, if you put conditions on these housing vouchers that say, hey, you have to move into a higher income neighborhood if you wanna receive this income, then over the lifetime of that individual, um, you are going to save money and lives. Uh, we have experimentally tested this in multi-center randomized controlled trials. Uh, it's very good evidence. Um, the health data comes only from uh, a small subsample of these, but it, it seems pretty robust and consistent with the economic evidence. Pre-K programs, you all know what those are. Uh, they have a lot of advantages. One of the advantage is that it allows uh, parents to, to work because uh, this is putting their kids in, in um, a school environment during the day. Uh, it also takes low-income kids out of a environment that is uh, potentially um, less enriching than, um, than they would have at home uh, for some families and more, more enriching for others. But in general, um, we, we, most pre-K programs are going to help kids read and write. And um, the, uh, the lowest quartile of families, uh, the children are exposed to about half as much vocabulary as the highest quartile of families. So, um, and about half as much math. So pre-K programs can really expose kids to more concepts and ready them for schools while also taking the kid out of the classroom. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, out of the house uh, so the parents can work, saves money and lives. We've experimentally tested this, but the results have been mixed. So Head Start is a program with mixed results um, but all of the strong early randomized controlled trials where you follow these kids through their lives are very small, but they've shown consistent and powerful results. Nurse family partnership uh, helps low income families with parenting and is uh, also provides educational support for the children, saves money and lives, very similar. Um, this is very well tested, experimentally tested in humans uh, through randomized controlled trials. Medicaid, uh, it may save money and lives, or it may cost up to 1.4 million per life saved. Um, the results on this are mixed. Um, ex there's one uh, experimental study and uh, numerous quasi-experimental studies. On the whole, I would say the results are, are pretty darn good that Medicaid is going to save uh, money and lives. Um, and in the worst case result, it's going to be slightly more cost-effective than blood pressure medication itself, um, which is uh, uh, something that Medicaid has no impact on is blood pressure um, over the short term um, in the experimental studies, but in the quasi-experimental studies, in the real world studies, it shows that it has big impacts. EITC, something I study as a PI on randomized controlled trials, multi-center, saves money and lives, really produces a lot of health. Um, so we've tested this experimentally and quasi-experimentally, left, right, front, and center, and it saves money and lives. Uh, reducing the number of children per classroom. Now this was an interesting study, multi-center randomized controlled trial, 
saves money. It saves money because these kids tend to go off and uh, do better in school. They had better fourth, eighth grade uh, performance. They had higher high school graduation rates, higher college attendance rates, but it also appeared to increase mortality. And the reason we think that this happened was because the kids were more confident and more social. They tended to die from you know, car accidents and uh, party events, drug overdoses, uh, pool drownings, things like that. So based upon that trial, we'll give it a seven out of 10. Safe routes to school, saves money and lives, making traffic uh, slower in, around schools. We only have observational data, bike lanes, come at a very good value. Uh, so we would, uh, we only have observational data, but uh, we would save uh, many, many, many more lives than we would with blood pressure medication. Slow zones in neighborhoods saves money in lives, but again, not great data. Freeway parks, you can filter the air coming out of uh, freeways by building parks over the top and give people place to have uh, recreation. Saves a lot of money because it increases property values around freeways. Um, it's projects that can be done in conjunction with developers, reduces pollution, increases opportunities for exercise, but we only have observational data, similar with bike share and pollution exercise, increases uh, uh, exercise, but we really only have observational data there. And uh, same with congestion pricing, which is charging cars to move into uh, congested urban city centers, saves money and lives, but the uh, data are pretty weak on that. Uh, these are only some examples of studies that have been done, mostly studies that I've done over my lifetime. Uh, so just to summarize, the health of Americans is on the decline. And this may be because we are not investing in the right policies. It's not it's not that we're spending not enough money or too much money, our policy mix is wrong. And we, uh, we have a lot of levers we pull, we, know, we can pull, we know which levers we need to pull. Uh, more studies need to be done, but we have a pretty good idea of some of the kinds of, national, of investments we can make at the state level or the national level that will improve population health in the United States and bring us up more in line with our peer nations. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Munig. That, I think you just answered um, one of our advisors' questions when we met with them this um, summer, was that they wanted to know what policies outside of the healthcare system will help them improve the health of Wisconsin families. And so I think that the run through of all of the various social policies that they might consider um, will be answering that question um, exactly. Um, if I could just ask one question. So if, if I'm a policymaker, if I'm a legislator, and I've just seen the list of the social policies, um, where would you put the money? What are the programs or the approaches that have the strongest body of evidence so that if a policymaker wants to both improve um, the well-being of Wisconsin families as well as their health, where would you start? Um, so you start with the things that are, um, you know, low hanging fruit, the things that were very sure uh, work and that were very sure save money and lives. So um, expansion of the earned income tax credit would be one great example of that. Uh, the earned income tax credit uh, can go higher. And what it is, is it's a, a credit for people who are working in low income jobs. Um, and as their work hours increase, the amount of credit increases um, so that when that person files taxes, they get taxes back. It's a, it's a program that has a wide bipartisan support. Uh, historically, um, it's been, uh, it's been uh, expanded and supported by uh, Republican administrations and Democratic administrations alike over time. So that's, that's where I would say would be the number one no-brainer um, place to put money uh, as one example. But of course, you want to go for this low-hanging fruit first that saves money and lives, and then uh, keep moving up from there until you get to uh, probably in the United States around, um, around $8 million per life saved is, is what we consider a good value. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that that, um, let's see, I think that that will um, conclude the, the part of the, the seminar where we're just asking clarifying questions. And I want to invite the rest of our speakers to show their screens and we will move on to questions for everyone. Now, if you've joined us late, um, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And before we open it up to questions, I just wanna mention that this seminar would not be possible without two generous funders, the University of Wisconsin-Madison Chancellor's Office and the Phyllis M. Northway Fund. And Phyllis M. Northway was a longtime county extension agent in Kenosha County. She was one of the earliest and strongest supporters of the Family Impact Seminars way back in the 1990s. I wanna thank both of them for providing generous support and helping to make this seminar possible. Okay, let's move on to our questions. Um, we have some questions here. So here's a question that maybe Pat, uh, you could start off. It's from Representative Jill Billings. If you could drill down into the infant mortality numbers, have we had any improvement in the last several years or slowed the decline? Well, again, it's a great question. Um, sometimes following your rank, um, uh, you know, the, the Badger basketball team can be drop, dropping in ranking, but it's just because other teams are getting better. We're in a tough Big Ten conference this year. So Wisconsin's infant mortality rate overall has been declining, um, but it hasn't been declining as rapidly as other states. So that's a, an important, um, many people, including myself, sort of quickly when we see our drop in rank, we think that things are getting worse. Smoking is another good example. Smoking rates have declined slowly, um, but not as quickly in Wisconsin as in other states. So, <clears throat> but what is important is to look at the subgroups um, for infant mortality, uh, not just by, where, uh, by community, but by uh, race and mother's education. And for and so it's a quite a complicated answer. Um, it depends. Uh, it depends on where you live. It depends on uh, the race of the mother and their social and economic uh, circumstances. <clears throat> There's a number of great resources, both at DHS uh, and uh, in our own Wisconsin Medical Journal, that, where people have sort of teased out the complexity of what seems to be a pretty simple number, just the number the rate of uh, infants who survived their first year. Um, but really, I would say the, the importance is in the details to dig down, to look at those circumstances where we uh, ha have not achieved the outcomes that we want. So it's, a, it, it's sort of a, it's not exactly an answer to your question. Things have been getting better in general overall, um, but our disparities have not been getting better. And, and when you look at the infant mortality rate in Milwaukee in particular, that's really driving our overall uh, challenges. Great, thank you, Dr. Remington. I have a question that perhaps Peter, if you wanna start on this one, it's from Senator Janet Bewley. Um, she suggests to colleagues that access to the internet is an essential component of quality of life. Can a direct link to health outcomes be a part of my argument? <laughs> uh, I would say that uh, any form of uh, education is going to be good uh, on face value, but I, I haven't seen any evidence um, for or against that. So I really don't know. I, my, my guess is probably, but I, I'm really not sure. All right. Um, I have a question from Justin B, who is a legislative staffer. Um, this one might be for you as well, Peter. Um, we've seen that there are multipliers for spending on education, spend X amount of dollars on education, get X amount of dollars in societal benefit. Is there a similar, similar multiplier for public health spending? Yes. Um, yes, certainly. Uh, uh, I think it is a very challenging question because as I sort of pointed out uh, during the talk, you know, education, you can spend it on pre-K, you could spend it on um, reduced classroom sizes, you could increase teacher salaries. Uh, but 
you're not going to get the same value out of all of those kinds of investments. Um, and this, the same is true uh, for other multipliers. So, um, you know, it's a very broad question. It really depends upon where specifically you, you channel your money. Um, and I think that, that that's the broader, broader policy point. But yes, there's, there is a, a, a very similar multiplier, um, but it depends upon the specific program you're looking at. Did anyone else have a comment on that? Okay, great. Um, we have a question. Um, this actually might go to all of you, but maybe Arjumand or Peter, you could take this one first. Um, how, in looking at all of these statistics and trends, um, how does the stress of a single parent household compare to the stress of a two parent household? So, um... Uh, we have direct data from randomized controlled trials. You want me to talk about those first, Arjumand? Or? Yeah, please go ahead, Peter. Sure. So um, from from, uh, from randomized controlled trials, you see um, that uh, that uh, families with with one parent uh, households tend to start. They tend to have uh, a lot higher stress uh, and a lot higher financial stressors than two parent households, um, simply because you've got twice as much income and you've got more child support, et cetera, et cetera, in a two family household. So um, we find that uh, money directed towards single parent households tends to have much bigger health impacts because uh, it, it helps supplement the income from, the, from the, uh, the partner who isn't there, who might be a provider as well. Archman, do you want to follow up? Uh, the only thing I, I can really think to add is that if you look at the child poverty rates, those are really an expression of the poverty of single women. So uh, single parent households are by and large households that are headed by low income, particularly um, single women. Uh, and so the stress of being low income uh, is, is, both an issue of being a, a single parent household, but that's really another way to say it's the stress of being a low income woman who's a parent. Great, thank you. Uh, one more question from Angela. What is the number one low hanging fruit of a state policy solution to address the root causes of health disparities? And Arjuman, you wanna take that one first? Sure. Um, so I'm going to answer this as the scientifically low hanging fruit. Um, and that is, to, that is to say what I perceive to be the, um, the avenue that has the most evidentiary support. And, and if you think about it, it's essentially how to provide more economic resources for uh, uh, low income families. And so that is both income and, by the way, wealth. So we tend to focus a lot on income, but uh, really what's driving income and the ability to produce income is wealth and particularly intergenerational wealth transfers. So the reason that higher income people are able to go to school, not have debt, get down payments for homes early in life and so on is because they get transfers from their parents and grandparents in previous generations. And so that cycle of economic inequality perpetuates because people start off life on different footings. And so to me, the most low hanging fruit would be uh, to do something about the wealth differential, which is then creating an income differential. Yeah, and just to follow that up, I, I, I would say that if I were to pick an intervention, it would probably be pre-K, uh, early, early intervention uh, programs like Nurse Family Partnership that have really proven to work. And I, I think one thing uh, that's very prescient is that um, in, 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 in uh, Nordic countries uh, where education is free throughout the, the whole uh, uh, life's the, the span educational years through college and everything um, uh, economic mobility is really high so people who are born into poor, poor families are almost as likely 
to become wealthy as people born into wealthy families in those countries. But in the US, economic mobility is really low. So if you're born into a poor family, you're stuck there. And one way of overcoming that barrier to increasing your wealth is through education. Pat, did you have anything to say? Well, I just couldn't agree more. Uh, this is, you know, this is what we talk about in public health is moving upstream, uh, you know, from the bedside to the community to those factors that influence children's lives. Um, and that's what the Family Impact Seminar is all about. Uh, if you can intervene early through not just evidence-based educational interventions, early childhood education, but cost saving. Um, we in public health talk about these as no brainers. Why wouldn't we as society, as policymakers invest in things that improve outcomes and save money? And I, I think Peter's research is you know, just um, uh, so important to put that really into practice, to, to look at those investments that achieve the outcomes we want, and either at a good value for society or uh, occasionally uh, cost savings. And I think early childhood education is a great example of that. Well, we are out of time. I want to apologize that we could not get to everybody's wonderful questions. I think we could keep going for hours and hours. Such a good discussion. So in our last moment, I just want to acknowledge the many people it takes to pull together a family impact seminar. And first and foremost, our three wonderful speakers, Peter, uh, excuse me, uh, Patrick Remington, Arjuman Siddiqui, and Peter Munig. If we were all in the room together, we would start clapping. Thank you so much for joining us today. I also want to give a special thanks to the Family Impact Seminar team that is behind the scenes. They are here with us today. You can't see them. Lisa Ellinger, our outreach director, Lisa Hildebrand, our communications director, Brittany Mitchell, our outreach and meeting specialist. Andy Lambert, our IT specialist, Bonnie McRitchie, my co-leader on the Family Impact Seminars, and Genevieve Caffrey, who's our project assistant and is a second year student at the La Follette School. Thank you all so much for making this a wonderful seminar. Thank you, Heidi. This, is, this has just been amazing. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I just wanna give everybody on the call, on the webinar today, one last reminder about our evaluation. Now, if you were at the seminar in person, we would bribe you with a piece of chocolate as you walked out the door when you gave us your evaluation form. We don't have chocolate today, but we do hope that out of the goodness of your heart, when you see that email today from us, that you will fill out the evaluation form. Your feedback is so important to us. And lastly, you can find the materials from all 39 seminars all the way back since 1993. All of those materials are on our website. We've covered topics such as homelessness, early childhood adversity, budgeting, corrections, other healthcare seminars. Please check out wisfamilyimpact.org. The video for this seminar will be posted within about a week. We will let you know when it's available. We also will be um, posting three more issue briefs. So we will have one issue brief that corresponds to each of the presenters today, plus a bonus one. And so with that, I would like to end and thank you so much for joining us for our first virtual Family Impact Seminar. We had about 200 of you on the webinar with us today and we could feel your energy. So thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed the seminar and be well. Thank you.